Man, all right, the title of the sermon this evening is Mephibosheth's Salvation. Mephibosheth's Salvation. So I'm going to be using the story and what took place here in 2 Samuel chapter number 9 of Mephibosheth. And I would like to, to use this story to highlight certain things that took place and similarities and show you that there's a great picture of your own salvation. And you can actually learn a lot about you know, the different doctrines of salvation. And hopefully at the end it'll make you more appreciative and grateful for your own salvation. We're going to begin in 2 Samuel chapter number 4. So most of the time we're going to spend in 2 Samuel 9. But turn over, if you will, with me to 2 Samuel chapter number 4. Now I said uh, Mephibosheth's salvation. Mephibosheth's salvation. So obviously Mephibosheth was saved from something. What was Mephibosheth's problem? I want you to look with me at 2 Samuel chapter number 4. Uh, look with me at verse number 4. The Bible teaches that Mephibosheth was lame. Look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul. And Jonathan, out of Jezreel, and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. So this is the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the grandson of King Saul. Now King Saul was the first original king of the nation of Israel. And Saul, of course, had the well-known son Jonathan, who was best friends, who was very close friends with who became the king, David. So Jonathan and David were very, very close friends. And one of Jonathan's sons was Mephibosheth. And it says that when Mephibosheth was five years old, was at the age, uh, was the age that Mephibosheth was when Saul and Jonathan were killed. When Saul and Jonathan were both slain in battle. And at this time, his nurse took him up and they fled out. So they fled at this moment when they had heard this news, when the tidings had came. And when she went to go pick him up, it says that she had dropped him when she was five years old. She wasn't born lame. I want you to notice that. He was not born lame, but she had dropped him. And at that moment, something obviously had happened. He had, he had you know, broken his legs, maybe both of his legs in some way. Maybe he fell a very far distance. That's a, you know, a, a very great possibility. But the way that he fell or what he fell on, whatever it was, it caused him to become lame, and he was lame for the rest of his life. Now, what it means to be lame is that you are, you are unable to walk. You do not have the ability to walk. That's what that is. It is, it is really, being lame is really one of the, the worst disabilities that you can have. Being lame, when you look at all the different disabilities, you know, uh, as far as physical disabilities, of handicaps, being lame is really one of the worst ones. There's a few that you could say that are pretty close to that, but... You know, what if you just lost one arm? You know, that's obviously not near as bad as not being able to walk. Even if you lost both arms, I would rather have my feet and the ability to travel to and fro than to have my arms personally. I think that it would be worse to be stuck in one spot, even if you could do things and had the ability to manipulate things right there where you were, I would still rather have my legs. I believe that it would be much worse to not be able to walk to and fro. You know, say the ability to you just use your fingers maybe or whatever it may be. But even still, what it does when you are no longer able to walk, it just makes you incapable to do things for yourself. When you're, when you're able to walk around, you, you can manipulate things with your mouth. You can maybe even manipulate things with your feet. You can learn how. I've seen this guy over in India who would build things. He'd build like, anybody ever seen that? Like little trucks, like with wood, with his feet. So you can still get around it. But when you have no legs, you're not going anywhere. When you have no, when you're not able to walk around to put your feet on the ground and to move from one place to the next, it really does render you incapable to do most of the things in life. Now I want you to turn with me to John chapter number 5. This is a picture of sin. And there's a few different uh, uh, times where we can see this picture being played out. And uh, if you haven't already, slide your bulletin there. Because like I said, we're going to be coming back to 2 Samuel, specifically chapter number 9. So we're going to turn to John chapter number 5. In the New Testament, there's a few different pictures of sin. And one of the most well-known pictures of sin in the New Testament, and specifically the Gospels when Jesus is going around, uh, is leprosy. And these are different things that have characteristics of sin, that different infirmities, because sin is an infirmity. Sin is something that has the power over you. It puts you into bondage. Sin is something that hurts you and harms you and holds you down. And one of the uh, uh, pictures in the New Testament of sin is leprosy, because it's infectious, because it spreads from one part, because it's slowly killing you. 
and it's incurable. There's nothing that you can do about it. There's nothing that you are able to fix. As far as you yourself, you can't get rid of it. Another great picture of this in the New Testament uh, and in the Gospels, with Jesus when he's going around, you know, he'd heal the lepers, but he's all, he would also heal the blind. This is another picture of sin. You'll, you'll see many people that were lepers that Jesus would heal. You'd see many people that were blind that Jesus would heal. There was a, 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 you know, a group or a collection of people that fell into these particular categories with these particular sins because it pictured sin greatly. And when he would, he would uh, 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 heal them of this, he would say, Thy faith hath made thee whole. And it was a picture of their salvation. He would even sometimes say, Thy, thy faith hath saved thee. So these infirmities pictured you know, our infection of sin or our infirmity of sin. Being blind is because you're lost in the world. You know, like it says in 2 Corinthians, um, you know, in 2 Corinthians, I can't remember particularly what chapter, maybe chapter 8 or something, but it says that, that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. So notice blindness has something to do with the unsaved and how when those people are in bondage to sin, Blindness plays that perfect part. When you're blind, you can't find things. You know what you can't find? You can't find the truth. You're incapable of finding the truth. You're not able to, to get out there and, to, and to, uh, uh, to, to look for what is right and what is, and what is true. Another picture is lameness, of people being lame. There's also a pattern of Jesus healing people that are lame. And again, the same reason is because you're incapable of helping yourself. You're in a state where you cannot fix yourself. You cannot fix your own problem. Look at John chapter number 5. Look at me at verse number 1. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of imp impotent folk. That means weak, like potent would mean strong. Impotent means weak. Impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie... And knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now I want you to notice that the picture here is that this man has been in this case for a long time. And that this man has been lying here in front of this water with this opportunity to be able to be healed miraculously. But you know what happened was he was not capable or he was not able to get there himself. You know, that, that water, what that water pictured was his salvation from this lameness or from this infirmity. And I want you to look with me at verse number 7, and I'll show you that fur further. When he responds, he says, The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So the picture that's trying to be painted here for the reader is the fact that this man is not able to heal himself. And the fact that this man is in a, in a situation where he is incapable of helping himself or healing himself. And he's in need of someone else to help him. Basically what's being painted here is that this man, this impotent man, this lame man is what? What would be a perfect word? Helpless, exactly. Perfect word. This man is helpless. He cannot do anything, can he? He's not able to fix himself. Now, there's, as I said, there's, a, there's this pattern of this series of different types of people that Jesus would heal because it perfectly pictures salvation. And we are the exact same way when we are in our sin. We are helpless. We are not able to fix our own problem of sin. Once you've sinned, once, once you have sinned and you've sinned in your life, you're not going to be able to just, just do good works that are just going to cancel out those bad things that you have done. Can you imagine standing before a judge and, 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 and they have proof of you on a camera of doing something, you admit to it, hey, I know I did that, but then you respond to the judge, but judge, look at all these good things that I've done. Don't you think that these good things should kind of like cancel out that bad thing? Don't you think that these good things that I've done should just basically just wash that away? 
the judge would look at you, at least if the judge was just, so maybe it's not a U.S. judge, but the judge would look at you and they would say, you're crazy. That has nothing to do with this. You still did this and you're guilty. That's the same thing with us and our sin. Once we sin, we're helpless. We're a sinner. We're obviously not going to be able to fix that problem. A sinner is not going to be able to help himself. And that's what this pictures. This pictures the fact that he's helpless. And you know what Mephibosheth was? He was helpless. And he needed to be saved from his sin. He needed to be saved from being lame. I want you to go back with me to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And that's what Jesus did for us was he saved us. He saved us when we were helpless. He saved us when we were weak. He, he saved us when we were without strength. Romans chapter number 5 verse number 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. So notice that when we were yet without strength. What does it mean to be impotent? It means to be without strength. That's exactly what it means. It means to be weak. That's what it was. And it says that when we were without strength, in context talking about us being sinners, it says that Christ died for the ungodly. So if Mephibosheth was going to be saved, if Mephibosheth was going to be helped, if someone was going to help him, obviously he couldn't do it for himself. Someone else was going to have to come do it for him. Someone else was going to have to come save him. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. 2 Samuel chapter number 9. I, I want you to look with me here at verse number 1 now. Begin here in, in this chapter. This is where we're going to be the rest of the night. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 9 verse number 1. It says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul? Look what he says, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. So notice here, this is David. And who is David? He's the king. David is the king, right? Verse 2, And there was of the house of Saul a servant, whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul? that I may show the kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. I want you to look at verse number 5. It was that David, David had to come. He was in need for someone to help him because he was helpless. Someone had to come to him. He had to have a messenger. So he sent Ziba. It says in verse number 5, Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. So notice that he was not able to help himself. He was in sin, so he needed someone else to help him. So obviously, we, just like we are in the state of sin, we needed someone else to help us. Who do we need? We needed Jesus, primarily. We needed the Savior to come and to help us while we were in our helpless state. But not only that, there had to be a Ziba that came. There had to be a man that came. David, in this case, he sent. The king sent. And someone else went on the king's behalf. Someone else went and knocked on their door. Someone else went to Mephibosheth's house and brought the news or brought the good tidings to Mephibosheth that, hey, you're going to be saved. Hey, there's going to be help. There's going to be uh, 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 you know, a blessing brought to you. In John chapter number 5, notice that the man needs the exact same thing. He was in need of the same thing. He was needed of a man to come to him to help him. In John chapter 5, Jesus had first asked him, Wilt thou be made whole? So Jesus asked rhetorical questions like that all the time. So he asked him a question. He says, Wilt thou be made whole? And I want you to listen to what the man says. He says that the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. So notice what he says. What does he need? He knows I can't do it on my own. I'm not able to do it on my own. So what did he say? I have no man. He knew that if he was going to be able to get there, if he was going to be able to drink of the water, if he was going to be able to be saved and be cured from his impotence, what did he need? He needed a man. He needed a Ziba to come to his door, just like Mephibosheth needed a man to come to him. They're not going anywhere. You know, there's a lot of Mephibosheths in this Jacksonville City area. There's a lot of people that are dead in their sins, and they're just sitting in their house. 
They're just sitting there and waiting. Mephibosheth was interested. This man here was yearning to get into that water. He was dying to get into that water. He wanted to be healed. And there are many people, many people like that in this city of Jacksonville. There are many people like that in all of the world. And Jesus has commanded us to go out and to preach to them. To bring the same message, the message of hope, the message of salvation that was being brought from the King David to Mephibosheth. He was helpless. And these people, they need a Ziba to go to them. Turn with me to Mark. I want you to turn over to Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter number 16. We are commanded to go out and we're sent out just like Ziba was sent to go to Mephibosheth and bring the good news, to bring the good tidings. Look at Mark chapter number 16, the commandment to all Christians. It says in Mark chapter number 16, verse number 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're commanded to go out and to bring that good news. Just like David sent somebody to Mephibosheth to bring the good tidings. You can see when, when Mephibosheth came, he fell down on his knees. You know, he said, behold thy servant. It was good news. Mephibosheth was happy. Mephibosheth was waiting for someone to help him, waiting for, for someone to just pull him out of this helpless state. And that's how all these people are. They're helpless. They need help. They're confused, they're lost, they're impotent. They know, just like how I had preached in the, in the sermon about the liberty of the resurrection, they know that they have a, a, a day of a reckoning. They know that they're a sinner. They have that guilt that they're carrying around on their shoulders and they know that there must someday be justice poured out. And that's why there are so many people when you knock on their door that are just, that are just ready. They just are looking for that man. I have no man. They're just looking for that man just to pick him up and carry him to the water. They're just looking for that man just to take him to the water and to give them help and to give them hope. That's you. That's all of us. That's our job as the local New Testament church is to go out, to go out as Ziba did and to knock on Mephibosheth's door and to say, hey, Mephibosheth, there's hope. Mephibosheth, there's hope. Hey, I know you got problems. I know you have issues. I... I know that you're, you're, you know, you're impotent, but there's hope. The king has sent for you. The king has sent me here to bring you a message of good tidings. And they're just waiting. They're just waiting for a man to come and knock on their door. They're just waiting for the man to come and just bring them the message. Please, take me to the water. Take me to the water. And you know what? You knock on the door sometimes and people aren't interested. But you and I both know that sometimes you knock on that door and you have that impotent man. And he was just waiting for you to carry him there. He was the Mephibosheth. He's just waiting for you to take him to the king's house. And he's ready to just drop on his knees and say, Behold thy servant. I knock on those doors all the time. That guy, Sean, yesterday, when Brother Hall and I were, were out knocking, immediately when I asked that guy, like, hey, you know, a lot of times, even the people you get saved, everybody knows what I'm talking about, even the people you get saved, when you say, hey, do you have a few minutes and I can show you? A lot of times, even the people that get saved, they respond like, yeah, I can take a few minutes. But then there's sometimes the people that are like, yeah, yeah, show me, show me. They're just like, please carry me, carry me to the water. Please just, they're just waiting for it. There's a big difference you know, out there oftentimes between some, and you know what? Hey, praise God that both get saved. Praise God that, hey, maybe they weren't that interested until you just started give, preaching the gospel to them. Hey, I'm still happy, just as happy for their salvation. But hey, there's people out there that, if, that are bouncing from one false religion to the next false religion to the next. They, they're being told, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I know Brother Rick, you know, he had been preached, repenting your sins. He said he just wanted to know the true gospel. He's just being deceived. He said he prayed the prayer like tons of times. He just wanted to be saved. There's tons of people out there. And they're the, in the same boat. They're just lying there, helpless, and they don't know what to do or how to get saved. You know what they want? They need a man. They have to have a man to carry them to the water. You're the man. You are the man. You have been given the ministry of reconciliation. If you're saved, then you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll look at that quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, look at verse number 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Some people are like, oh, well, the, the soul winning thing's not for me. No, it's for, have you been reconciled? 
He said that he reconciled us to himself, right? He reconciled us to himself and hath given to us, the same group, the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know who the ministry of reconciliation is for? Those that have been reconciled. So if you've been saved, then the ministry of reconciliation is given to you. It's your job. Jesus sent out his disciples and he wanted them to go preach and teach all the same things that he had preached and teach to them. He sent out his disciples to go into the world and if you have been reconciled, just like his disciples were reconciled and given the ministry of reconciliation, if you've been reconciled, then he's given you also the ministry of reconciliation and it's your job. There's somebody out there that's helpless and impotent that needs you to carry him to the water. It's your job. They need a Ziba and you can be their Ziba. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. So number one, he was lame. That was his sinful condition. Just like our sinful condition. And we were weak. Number two, he, because he was lame, he needed someone to come to him. He couldn't do it on his own. He was helpless. He couldn't do it on his own. So he needed Ziba. He needed a messenger to come to him. He needed a man. Number three, Mephibosheth was given mercy. This was not something that Mephibosheth had earned. This was not something that, that Mephibosheth deserved, but he was given mercy. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 9. Again, look at verse number 1 one more time. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So notice that he's not doing this for uh, uh, Mephibosheth's sake. It's not for Mephibosheth. It's for Jonathan's sake. So it's not something, there's a lot of SHs and S's here, so you've got to bear with me. So it's not for something that Mephibosheth did. It's not like, oh, Mephibosheth was a very righteous man. David didn't even know who he was. He had no idea who he was, and he's just like, hey, is there anybody that's Jonathan's son? Is there anybody that I can show him grace or show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? He's like, oh, yeah, there's this guy Mephibosheth. Did he deserve it? Was it because he knew? And he's like, hey, this is a really good guy. It had nothing to do with it. Could Mephibosheth have been a really evil guy? He could have been. He could have been a bad dude, couldn't he? He could have been a very sinful man. But did that matter? Didn't have anything to do with it. Just like salvation. It's not based on how good you are. It's not based on how you live your life. That has nothing to do with it at all. The Bible says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. It says his faith is counted for righteousness. So it's not because you're good. If you're working your way, then you're not given grace. You're given debt. You're, you're going to you know, build up a bunch of debt from all of your sin because the wages of sin is death. But if you just put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then he'll give you mercy. He'll give you grace and he'll give you kindness that you haven't earned. He'll give you grace and mercy Instead of giving you the reward that is due, that would be due unto you. So he gives you grace and he gives you mercy. So notice that he showed him mercy. Mephibosheth didn't deserve it. He didn't know how good he was or how bad he was. Remember when Jesus tells the parable? He first, he's like, hey, you know, this man, you know, was having a wedding. He says, hey, go out and invite these people. They're like, ah, I'm busy, right? Go out and invite these people. They say the same thing. Hey, I'm busy. You know what he says? Go out and find the, do you remember? One of the things in the list is the lame. He says the good and the bad, the lame, the impotent. He's like, just go out and get anybody. Good, bad, it doesn't matter. Because it's not based on how good you are. Because you don't deserve it anyways. You already have enough sins that would not allow you. One sin doesn't allow you into heaven. So you already have enough sins that would not allow you into heaven. So it's not based on how good you are. He didn't, it didn't matter to David how good Mephibosheth was. He was going to show him mercy and kindness anyways. He's going to show him mercy anyways. The other thing is this, that he shows him mercy... For Jonathan's sake. For Jonathan's sake. Now, who is Jonathan? Jonathan is the son of the king, isn't he? The very first king is who? Saul. And who was Saul's son? Jonathan. Jonathan. Now, how, do, how are we shown mercy? How are we shown grace? Because of who? Because the son of God. Because the son of the king, aren't we? Just like the same situation. Look again at chapter number 9, verse number 1. Another element to that. It says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? Look at this. For Jonathan's sake. So he wasn't just showing him mercy or grace just to show him mercy or grace. It was specifically, he was imputing unto him the mercy and the grace. He was imputing unto him the goodness that Jonathan deserved in David's eyes. He was giving him the goodness and the righteousness that Jonathan deserved because of jo for Jonathan's sake. I want you to look again. Look further down at verse number 7. And David said unto him, Fear not, 
For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now why does he say fear not? Look at verse number 6. We read this earlier. It says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And then David said unto him, Fear not. For, meaning because, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. Do you know what he's saying? Like, hey, don't be worried. It's almost like Mephibosheth is like, it's obvious that Mephibosheth is very humble because he realizes, I don't deserve this. And then David is like, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be worried. It has nothing to do with you. That's not why I'm doing this. You have, you know, it's, it's not because of you that I'm doing this to you. I'm going to show you mercy for Jonathan's sake. Notice how he's, how he's afraid, how he's worried, how he's concerned. Almost like he realizes, like, I'm a bad guy. I don't, I don't deserve this. If David's going to give me what I deserve, this is not going to be good. Right? And he's like, hey, don't be afraid. Don't worry about the things you've done. I'm not going to hold that against you. Think about that. Don't worry about all the bad that you've done, all the sins that you've committed. Fear not, because I'm going to show you grace and kindness for Jonathan's sake. Isn't that exactly what happens in our situation with salvation? When you stand before God, you technically, in a technical sense, have a whole lot of sins to answer for. In a technical sense. You have a whole lot of sins that you've committed all throughout your life. Right? But thank God that they're under the blood of Jesus Christ. And that he died for you. And when you stand before the king, just like Mephibosheth stand, stood before King David, you know what? You could fall down and be afraid because of the glory of God. You know what he could say to you? Fear not. I'm going to show you grace and I'm going to show you kindness for my son's sake. I'm going to show you grace and I'm going to show you kindness for Jesus Christ's sake. It's the exact same situation. He obviously realizes, hey man, I've done a lot of bad stuff and I'm afraid to stand before the king for the punishment that I could deserve. And he's like, hey, I'm not judging you based on what you did. I'm going to impute unto you the righteousness that Jonathan deserves. I'm going to give you all, the, all of the goodness and the kindness that I would have showed to Jonathan because a good friend that he was to me. All the good that he did to me. The good that he did in my eyes. So we can see here, we can see that the imputation of Jonathan's righteousness is being given unto Mephibosheth. Just like Christ's righteousness is being imputed unto us. Not only that, we see the adoption of sons. When we get saved, we're adopted as a son, just like Mephibosheth was adopted as one of David's sons. Look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 9, verse number 11. It says, Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, saith the king, said the king, he shall eat at my table, look at this, as one of the king's sons. So notice how he's treating him. What's the definition of adoption? You know, adoption isn't always something that's by law, right? It doesn't have to be you're legally adopted and things like that. What does it mean to adopt someone? What does it mean to adopt anything, right? It means to take something and to put it in another place and to, and to start treating it as if it's something else, right? It's to take, let's say, a child that's not yours, to bring it into your house and adopt that child in the sense that now you are treating that child as if it is your child. It's to take maybe a, a, a son of someone else's that was abandoned by someone or maybe their father's dead like in this situation and you take that son and you begin to treat that child like he's your son. And that's what happened to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was adopted by King David. He came and you know how he was treated? He was treated just like he was one of David's sons. It's the same thing that happens with our salvation. Look over with me to, at John chapter number 1, verse number 12. So make sure you put your bulletin there. John chapter number 1, verse number 12. <clears throat> John chapter number 1, verse number 12. I'm going to read to you from Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 5 says, <clears throat> uh, verse 4 and 5, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. I want you to look with me at John chapter number 1, verse number 12. So notice that we are adopted as sons. 
Just like Mephibosheth was taken in and he was treated like he was one of David's sons. David adopted him as one of his sons. At the moment of salvation, we're born again into God's family and we become a son of God. Look at verse number 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So at the moment of salvation, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you call upon the name of the Lord, at that very moment, you become a son of God. You, when we say you're born again, what we're saying is you're born again into God's family. You're born again by the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of adoption, as we just saw. It's the Spirit of the Son. So when God looks at us now, He looks at us through His spiritual glasses, and He no longer sees the sins that I've committed in the flesh. And you know what He sees? He sees the Spirit of His Son. And He doesn't view me as being a foreigner. He doesn't view me as being a child of this world or a child of the devil. He views me as being a son of His, a son of God. It's the same thing that happened with Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was not David's son. Mephibosheth was not born into David's family. Mephibosheth technically had lost all rights to any sort of kingship and any sort of, of uh, treatment. You know, uh, um, Saul was from the tribe of what? Benjamin, exactly. David was from the tribe of what? Judah. He, you know, and, and Mephibosheth was, you know, obviously of the line of Saul. So there was no, there was no possession. There was, there was nothing that was falling rightfully to Mephibosheth any longer. He had totally just lost out. You know what's interesting, what we had read earlier, when did it take place with Mephibosheth? How old was he? He's five years old. Wouldn't you say, just, just trying to guess at your own children's age, of, of when it seems like they, they, uh, uh, they, they get to the age of accountability, what would you say that that is? When they really start getting what's right and wrong. Three, four, five years old, wouldn't you? Real close to that. Notice that Mephibosheth wasn't born lame, and he was actually born, you know, let's say righteous. Let's say that he was born as an heir to the throne. Children, when they're born, they are born, yeah, they have a sinful nature, but the Bible teaches that, they, that that is not held against them until they get to the age of accountability. If you die before you, the, the law, when the law comes, like Paul talks about, you know, then once you understand it, the law comes, you understand it, and you choose to disobey, then you are dead in your sins at that moment. And that's normally around the age of five or six. Isn't that interesting? That he was a rightful heir if he would have, you know, at that moment, let's say Saul died, you know, uh, and David wouldn't have taken the throne. What would have happened? Jonathan died, then he would have been an heir. At that moment, technically, he would have been an heir is the point. You know, and then something happened at that age and he became lame. I believe that's a perfect picture of a child sinning, losing that ability to go to heaven at that moment. They've become impotent They've become weak, and now they need to be redeemed. They need to be adopted back into the king's family. They need to be adopted back into the king's family, and they have to be born again. So there's many levels of, of uh, a symbolism here. Go back to 2 Samuel with me, 2 Samuel. And I want to look at just uh, one more point here. I want to look at the great humility. The great humility. <clears throat> the great humility of Mephibosheth. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 9. Look at verse number 8. It says, and he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Now that is great humility. When you look in the Bible, the, the, the lowest creature, the creature that is just the, the most frowned upon, the most you know, low and dirty and disgusting creature, when somebody really wants to like criticize you or criticize themselves, they're always like, what am I, a dead dog? What am I, a head of a dead dog? Over and over again. So you notice you, what you see here is you see the great humility of Mephibosheth standing before David. He comes before the king and he says, it's where he says, and he bowed himself. So he even bows himself down and says, what is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? He comes before and he says, why are you even considering me? It makes me think of the verse that, that where David actually says himself, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Think about this. If Mephibosheth, if Mephibosheth came before David and, and he demonstrated this sort of humility before a, before a worldly king, how much more humble should you be before the king of kings? 
How much more humble should you be personally before the Creator and the God of the universe? And you look at this example of him, and you know what he realizes? Hey, I don't deserve any of this. It, I don't deserve to be standing before you like this. This attitude that Mephibosheth has at the moment of his salvation is actually an attitude that Mephibosheth carries out later on in his life. And the other point, I want to just throw a couple nuggets at you and we're going to be done. A couple other uh, real interesting nuggets is that he's a co-heir. Just like he was uh, adopted to be a son, he now becomes a co-heir and he, he inherits land and he dwells in Jerusalem continually and he eats bread continually. Look with me at verse number 10. It says, Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shalt till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. So notice that he's, got, he's gonna have, continually going to have food to eat and people doing it, bringing it for him. Look at what it says in verse 7. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will, rest and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. So notice, He's, being, he's inheriting land, isn't he? And you know where he's specifically living and inheriting is Jerusalem. Look at verse number 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. So you know where he went? He went to Jerusalem. Where are we going to go when we die? What are we going to inherit? New Jerusalem. You know what he does? He goes and he sits down and he eats at the king's table. What does it talk about us doing with Jesus? We're going to sit down and we're going to eat at the table. It talks about you know, how he's going to drink new wine with us. And it talks about how he's going to serve us. And Jesus also mentions that we are going to be eating manna. He says he's going to give unto us hidden manna. He's going to give us unto us bread. What is Mephibosheth doing here? He's eating bread. He's sitting there and it says that he's eating bread all way. You know, that is a picture, I believe, of, it says continually, even there in verse 13. It says all way up in, I believe, uh, uh, well, he says continually again in verse 7. One of the verses he says all way, just saying continually. That's what it means. So he's going to be doing it continually. That's a picture of it not being taken from you. Uh, another, a perfect uh, a picture of Christ preserving our salvation and it's not up to us. It didn't matter what Mephibosheth did. He wasn't going to lose this, 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 this spot. And the way that you can prove that is, do you remember what happened with the Gibeonites? I thought of this. This, this I thought of after. I read this and kind of came up with some of these points. But then I thought of this while I was preparing this this afternoon. The Gibeonites, Saul went and, and Saul killed the, the Gibeonites and, was, and it says that he was very bloody. In the Gibeonites, there's a great plague that comes in the land in the days of David. And David implores God, you know, uh, he, he prays to the Lord and he says, you know, why is this plague? For whose sake? And he says, it's for Saul's sake, for he slew the Gibeonites and was very bloody. And he goes and he tells the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites are, hey, we don't want anything, but we want the sons of Saul. We want the heads of the sons of Saul. We want seven of them. You know what David does? It tells you specifically, it says these words, it says that David spared Mephibosheth for his oath's sake. There was nothing that was going to change that. You know why? Because he promised. Because he promised to Mephibosheth and he promised to Jonathan. It's the promise that he gave to his son and Mephibosheth was the inheritor of that promise. Just like we're an inheritor of that promise through the seed of the son, of the king's son. And he said that he, he was not going to go back on his promise in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He had a promise that he won't break it. There's another thing too. When, when, when David flees because Absalom is trying to kill him, remember how Ziba lies. It's, it's Ziba the servant. He lies and he's like, you know, uh, you know Mephibosheth, you know, he's, he's, uh, 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 he's defected, right? He's when he's with Absalom and he lies about him and all that. When David comes back, you remember David shows him mercy even still then. David shows him mercy even still in the end of his life. And his nails were grown out, his hair was grown out. And one of the things that that, that, that picture proves to me is that Mephibosheth still needed, still needed uh, uh, King David. Just like we still need Jesus to preserve us in the end of our lives. That Jesus is the one that preserves our salvation. That if it were to be all left up to us, we wouldn't be able to do it. If it was just left up to you to keep your own salvation, he can give you everything. He could put you in the king's palace, give you bread, give you everything that you need. But if he just abandoned you and left you, you'd be right back to where you were before. 
with your nails all grown out, your hair all crazy. He hadn't, I think it says something about him not trimming his toenails or something for an extremely long time. So the guy's just a wreck. And not only can you apply that to salvation, but it's the same for living a good, clean, righteous life. If you try to just do things on your own, like, hey, I can handle it. I don't need church. I don't need the Word of God to be a light unto my path. You know, I'm wise enough now where I can make my own decisions. You'll end up like Mephibosheth. When Mephibosheth, when David got away from him, he just went to hell in a handbasket. He started falling apart, didn't he? Just like if you get away from Jesus, the same thing will happen. Just like if you want to go your own way, obviously in this case, Mephibosheth wasn't able to do anything. But in that case, you know, he, ne he still needed David. He needed David there to help him. There was a few other points, but I'm not going to go over them right now. But yeah, there, uh, you can see the great, these are those nuggets that I love to find in the Bible. Where it's a perfect picture of salvation. There's so many different elements. You can find every aspect of our own salvation. You can see him there calling upon the name of the Lord, calling upon the name of David. You can see him being shown grace and mercy. Just many, many elements. Great elements of salvation where we can learn much about our own salvation. You know what it should do when we see someone like this? We see Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth still in the end of his life being humble, just like he was in the beginning. And do you remember what Mephibosheth says? He's like, I don't deserve it. Just take it from me. And David's like, no, you're keeping it. You'll still keep everything. You're going to keep everything that I gave you. This doesn't matter what happens to you. You know, David will still, Jesus will still give it to you. He'll still keep his promise. And we should stay just as humble as the day of your salvation. I'm sure if you look back and you think about, you know, at the moment, I know myself. That's all that I can base my, you know, uh, testimony upon. I know the day that I got saved that it was a very humbling experience. That I was very humble before the Lord, just like Mephibosheth was. You know what the best thing is in your life that you need to, to, to watch out for and to make sure that you continue to do? That is to be humble. Keep the humility that you had the day of your salvation, just like Mephibosheth kept his humility. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the great examples in the Bible where we can reflect upon our own salvation. We can learn more doctrines about our salvation, about adoption, about imputation of righteousness, about grace and mercy and salvation not being of works. We thank you for all of these different great pictures and just seeing the, the, the uh, magnificence and the majesty of the word of God, these little hidden nuggets that we can learn from, these Easter eggs. We ask you that you would continue to bless our church here, bless everyone that was here, dear Lord, in their ears, and that they would be interested in the Word of God and love it and have zeal for it, and that you would bless all the families, bless the food and those that prepared it, dear God, and uh, continue to bless, as I said, uh, our church and our services. We love you so much, and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.